My name is Mike McLaughlin. I head up the tech marketing team. Um, I'm here to walk through some demonstrations of the product. Um, I, I have these in recorded video. Um, I'm going to back off of the internet connection here and trying to do this live. Um, I'd like to invite anybody here or that's watching this that would like to go further into this. We can certainly set up sessions where I take into the lab and we can go off into a lot of little corners of what's going on here. But for the next couple of minutes, what I want to do is, is, is give you an idea of what this looks like now, some of the things that Hugo's just talked about, um, and, and sort of managing and monitoring an environment that is uh, running DVX. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and kind of kick in here. The first thing I want to point out is, is we're actually running inside of a vSphere web client. So our UI basically plugs directly into the environment where the administrators are going to live and do most of their other tasks. This is our dashboard here. <clears throat> and we can see at the very top level of the dashboard, essentially a summary of the conditions. Um, this particular environment has a handful of hosts and VMs running active. We can see the performance running here. This is essentially uh, IOPS throughput, latency, and uh, on the right-hand side, that 100% uh, um, flash hit rate is, is actually fairly important. The, the DABG latency here, I want to point out at the top level, because we're going to descend down to the VM level and back up and kind of look at the environment as an administrator might in the course of their day. <coughs> but the, the latency here is being averaged over the last few seconds across the entire set of virtual machines under DVX management. And think of this as, as what's happening at the VDisk level. All right, it's not at the component level or at the particular host level, but it's at the aggregate sort of VDisk level across the VMs. We can dig into those other things if we, we need to look for something in the environment. Okay, let's kind of let this roll. So now, um, notice here my latency, if you kind of watched that, was about 1.9 and about 3 point something. That's okay, but I'm not ent entirely happy with that. We're going to go looking for a con the conditions in here. And I think that's part of the sort of simplicity here is how easy is it, to, is it to get around. On this dashboard, though, I can also see some other things about the back end, uh, how the scalability, how much capacity I have, and also just sort of what the, the, the context looks like. Now, this is running in, essentially in a real-time view. Um, I also have historical data being captured on the systems, so on the, the, the data node and the compute node. And I can chart through this, so I don't have to connect to another utility, another site, or another service to kind of look at historical data as well. It's being captured on the system. All of those key performance indicators that I want about latency, throughput, capacity utilization. Um, I can see trending here to some degree. Um, we have day, week, month up there on the very top, and we're going to kind of go through that in just a minute. But I'm, I can essentially look at the granularity of information. So if I'm trying to monitor or troubleshoot or do some planning as an administrator, I have the data at my fingertips now to sort of look at what's going on in my environment. All right, I can back up for a week here or even go back a month, literally up to a year or however long uh, that, you know, we've been collecting data. I can also select over these ranges um, to see sort of what's going on, scroll it out, slide it around. So it gives me a nice way of essentially moving around. And you can see here um, some peaks. This is one of my test labs. So we run various different workloads for experimentation. But on the left-hand side, if I were to stop and sort of drop my cursor, I would see that point in time characteristics. All right. On the right-hand side, we also have the ability to uh, essentially isolate key performance out of that whole data set. All right. Now remember at the top, the latency, the read and write latencies. I said we're OK, but they weren't great. Well, I'm going to look at VMs here for read and write latency. And this is essentially going to um, bubble up through the inventory for the current time what's going on. And I've got a couple of here. Application 1, Application 2 is what I'm calling them. And you can see that they're actually, they're actually having a little bit of a tough time on the writes. All right? Now, this is, this is intentional. This is part of the demo. It's part of the lab. But this could happen in your environment, too. All right? What I want to do, there's a couple of ways of figuring out where to go address that. I could go directly down to the virtual machine and see what he's doing. I'm going to instead come down one level from my vCenter into my host. All right, and I've got a set of hosts here, five different hosts that we saw um, identified on the top. This is a mix and match, actually. I've got Cisco Blades in here. I've got HP servers. I've got compute nodes in here. I've got some white box. But I can look at the hosts now and see how they're doing. I can look at their performance, their reads and writes. I can look at their latencies. And for the, for the cautious here, notice that 2.7 at the bottom there. That's sort of that one of the highest write latencies there is uh, 2.7. We're going to go looking for that particular host to see what's going on. All right, and it happens to be the one down here, 1512. Okay, 
Uh, yeah, I've been, I've been working on, I'll, I'll pull that up in a minute. Yeah. But let's, okay. Yeah, I, 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 we can do this live in the lab too, but I, like I said, I just don't want to suck up the network trying to broadcast up here for now. Um, this was the host that had the high latencies on it. All right. And you can see that they're running about one plus and two plus here. And there's application one sitting there as one of the top VMs on this. And I noticed that it's not in insane mode. And Hugo talked about that a little earlier. This host is only deployed in fast mode right now. But I'm going to go ahead and basically push some of the resources that that host has available to see if I can't solve that latency problem just with this simple operation. Is, is basically, if there's resources to be had, let's let the host try to solve that. One other thing that I want to point out here is this, this shortage here on the host flash map. So we're talking about some, some boundaries and stuff. I might. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't break. That was intentional. And, and I can rewind it. We're going to cover this in a little bit more detail. I've got one specifically for this that's actually a lot more fun. But notice that we went from about 30-something thousand to over 60,000 um, IOPS on this particular host. And our latencies literally cut in about half. They've dropped significantly just by telling this host to go ahead and use more of its local CPU processing power to service the I.O. of those VMs on that host. All right. I was pointing out that I've got, I, I might actually be running into a, a, a flash map shortage here. I'm still getting 100% flash hit rate, which is good. But these applications might begin to become a, a burden. And what I want to do is make sure that I, I move those or move workloads around to, or put more flash in this system. All right, so now we're back at the top. We can see that our latencies overall in the system have improved significantly. The IOPS have gone up a little bit more as well. And if I were to look at historical charts, over on the right-hand side where I was at 15 milliseconds on those two applications, now over the last few seconds, they're averaging in much better. If I were just to sit here and wait, those numbers would actually go down a little bit more as they sort of average, average in. So we have the ability to look at sort of point in time aspects as well as sort of the aggregate that's happening through the environment, all right? And here we are, we've got a nice uh, sort of performance here on that particular host. And again, I could go in and drill into that host and say, what's he been doing? You can guess this is one of my demo hosts. And if I scroll down, I push him in and out of fast mode a lot. And every time I push him back into fast mode, he gets these latency spikes. All right, those applications that are running on there are pushing I.O. and they want the horsepower. So every time I push it back out, those little spikes there are just from me doing demos over the last bit. So, so in regards to insane mode and normal mode. Right. Is that a manual process? Or is that right. something that I can have something trigger based on some threshold that I define? Uh, right now it is a manual process. Okay. Yeah, so the, 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 the act of putting a host into insane mode um, is something you can do through the UI or through um, you know, sort of back-end scripting, but it's not anything that's triggered by other by events. Action. By action. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah we, we, were, we were talking about this last night. I mean, why, why not leave it in insane mode? It's a resource balancing issue for you, um, but the capability there of kind of showing what we can do by taking more resources to service the I.O. Is, is really a key point here. Okay. Are there durability issues with with the flash when you put it in exchange in ex insane mode, or is it strictly just CPU acceleration? That's so um, good question. The, the the flash durability is 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 tied to how hard the applications are running. If if the, if the applications are doing more, you know they're gonna they're gonna do more I/O. I mean that's just a, a longevity issue. But the, but the the immediate aspect for the the workload in the host is no. It's natural. So I think maybe I can yeah. add a little bit. So we have a log-structured file system for the flash. Thank you. So we've done durability study for years. Uh, insane mode is basically CPU acceleration. It has no effect on flash. Uh, and you know, you should just think about it as giving more CPU. And uh, flash continues to work the same way. Feels like the turbo button on the old one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is there any sort of automatic failover to insane mode? If you know, if one of the hosts is running high, or does the admin still have to go in there and say, hey, we're having performance issues, let me talk a lot? Yeah, like I said, right now, the, the insane mode is, is still a, a user choice. It's yeah. we're, the, do you have an API? Can I do a monitoring tool? Mm -hmm. Can I have, you know, Turbonomics monitor it when that host hits oh, or latency nice. or yep. to fire off an API call, flip it to insane mode? Yeah. That's not an API. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Come> on. <laughs> All right. Any plans for that? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, we uh, 
Uh, just wanted for the product to settle down a little and then find development partners so we can develop APIs in a way that uh, really supports what our customers want to do. Is there a interface to this system not in vCenter, like on the data node, or I mean, where would be the API target for this? Yeah, no, there is. You can you can log into the system. Uh, there is a shell there. There's very little you have yeah. to log into it for. Yeah. But um, but I was just is. thinking, since there's no real controllers and there's no real management nodes due to the distribution. Okay. Yeah, you, you can log into the data node, and and the compute nodes are just running right now ESX, and they have services in the background. All right. How are we doing on a, a time window? Time for one more short little demonstration of something here, because um, this is this is uh, a, essentially a, a scalability and in, in sane mode, and what I'll say, sort of the, the last few storage administration uh, functions that that we've left once you're running on DBX. All right. So again, we're starting off in the vCenter environment. Um, this is another one where I, I, I've, I've got just a couple of hosts here, three hosts, and they're running at a, a, an aggregate of about 30,000 IOPS with a, almost five millisecond total latency, all right? And the, the, the key thing here is what I want to I show is scalability by moving workloads around and taking advantage of the insane mode. It's a little hard to read, but I've got three hosts here, and the key thing is the top host is the only one reporting any information, all right? The bottom two are basically sitting out, you can see the dashes in this, so they're, they're idle hosts of resources that I have. And what I'm gonna do is drill into this host and see that that 32,000 IOPS that it was generating uh, roughly is, is okay, but it's, it's again in fast mode. I'm gonna go ahead and push this one into insane mode. This is gonna get a little redundant after a minute, but the idea is by taking the host resources and picking what they are and putting them into insane mode or picking appropriate host resources, I can increase the performance of the overall system. So we were talking a little bit about scalability. This one basically jumped up to about 65. Now, that host is running all of the applications, all right? I've got four of these uh, little worker VMs that, uh, sitting on that one host, all right? Now, I've called them performance VMs because they're basically I.O. hungry. They're pushing hard, and that's, they're essentially generating about 66,000 I.O. on their own. Um, we're going to go take a quick look at, at where they're located. They're all sitting on that first host that was, was showing up in the, the table that had all the information. Now, as a VM administrator, I can look and say, well, I've got two idle hosts. I've just added them into my environment. Let me move some, some application around. All right? I'm just going to essentially take this and let these virtual machines um, take resources from another host. So this one's moving it on to the second host. And the first and second host, to give you a little clue, are both the same. They're both the same architecture. They're roughly 20 core machines, all right? And it, once I move that second VM over, I'm expecting to get at least another 30,000 I.O. out of it because um, that's that second machine being like the first one. So now I'm up at 90. And you can guess if I drill into that particular host, um, we can see it's doing about half of what the other one was. I'm going to put it into insane mode, bring it up to snuff. And then the last two virtual machines that I have that are still sitting on that first host, kind of getting bogged down, I'm going to move those actually onto my third host. Now the third host is a little bit different, all right? We have uh, a system with a 32 core um, architecture in it, all right? Almost twice as much CPU power, all right? And the, we, the, the mix of flash, whether they're SATA, SAS, or even NVMe, um, has some in impact, but only sort of at the very upper levels. It's more of an architectural choice of, of the, the, the engineer or the, the administrator that wants to build their system. But as I move these additional virtual machines onto that third host, now I'm going to actually have to move two of these virtual machines to take up some of that bandwidth, all right, on that third host. And we can see here there's one moved over. Let me move that fourth one over. It just takes a minute while we're talking. But essentially, I'm, I'm as an administrator, distributing the load. Now, I, one of the questions is, it can, you, can that be automated, all right? Well, because we're, we had decent performance to begin with, if 30,000 I.O. and, and sub, you know, five millisecond latency wasn't an issue, we would have never detected it, all right? So I'm not having a CPU shortage, I'm not having a memory shortage, I'm not having any of the traditional sort of DRS triggers. So this is, like I said, one of the storage administrations, making sure things are balanced out, all right? That being said, do you recommend customers disable DRS so there's not excessive vMotion and then excessive cache warming between nodes? Um, we actually run DRS in-house in and on many of our systems, and it, because of some of the, the fingerprinting and the, the way we do deduplication, very little impact on having, unless your environment's really stressed. 
moving VMs back and forth, you know, if they're moving like every 10 minutes, you've, there's other things that you've got to take into consideration. But having virtual machines move because of either CPU or memory resources, and they'll bring the workload along with them. Here's the one thing is if, if, if they're going to get IO starved, they're going to show the results and they'll move naturally to some places. There are some operations, particularly in demos, where you sort of have to manually move them so you can demonstrate what's happening because yeah. you don't have DRS enabled. How CPU intensive is it to uh, warm the cache over on another host? So let's say you're already a little CPU starved over there and you're migrating machines over to take resources off of one host. That's a lot of data to move over to the other host to warm the cache over there. Yeah, I, I, I would say as long as the resources there, you should be okay. I mean, if a, if a VM is moving from a host with, with limited resources to another host with, that's already CPU constrained, that's that's a different problem. <laughs> yeah. well, I guess I can yeah. add it. Yeah. So we don't just do a forklift to yeah. move, right? You don't just take a hundred gigabytes and right. copy it. So what happens there is so there's prefetching going on over time. So we try to avoid a big hiccup after the motion. So if if you're doing remote reads, well, we prefetch a little bit more and we stream it over time to avoid actual resource constraints yeah. on on the source. Yeah. So the, the net here, we get to the end that one host that was running the four applications at about 30,000 IOPS, by kicking them all, all up into insane mode and moving it on to additional hosts and additional hosts with a lot more core, you can see I've got 60 to 70 and all the way up to 95,000 coming out of those resources simply by exploiting the server-powered storage coming out of the DBX. And that's kind of you know, what I wanted to point out here from a, a storage administrator's perspective really wasn't managing storage. I was really just moving resources around and making sure they're balanced and working at this all at the virtual machine level.